January 14, 1950, West Point, New York. 21-year-old Richard Colvin Cox, a second-year cadet at the United States Military Academy, tells his roommate that he is planning to go out to dinner with a visitor, but he does not return and is eventually reported missing. During the preceding week, Cox was visited on multiple occasions by a man whose name may have been George, and Cox is believed to have been with him when he vanished. Over the years, there are a number of different theories presented about Cox's disappearance, including that he was recruited to perform secret work for the CIA, but he is not heard from again, and the mysterious George is never identified. After that, the trail went cold. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest episode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host, Robin Warder, and today we're going to be exploring an odd military-themed mystery, the 1950 disappearance of Richard Colvin Cox. That voice you just heard narrating our intro was Charles Cage, the latest winner of our most recent Trail Went Cold listener voiceover contest, so thank you very much, Charles. This has been a recurring monthly contest which you've been holding for nearly four years now, and if you'd like to enter and haven't already done so, I will be providing instructions near the end of this episode. Anyway, the disappearance of Richard Colvin Cox was the case Charles requested I cover when I originally entered this contest, and I've actually been wanting to do an episode about this one for a long time, because it's a pretty unique story, as it involves a cadet who somehow vanished while attending the United States Military Academy in West Point. To give you an idea of how prestigious this place is, West Point is the oldest continuously occupied military post in the United States, as the Academy was originally founded over 200 years ago in 1802. But Cox is the only cadet who has ever gone missing from there, which is why a massive investigation took place when it happened. The key to this mystery is a man known only as George, who visited Cox at the Academy no less than three times in the week prior to his disappearance, but no one has ever been able to establish his identity. Over the past several decades, there have been no shortage of theories about what happened to Cox, such as him starting a new life under a new identity after being recruited to work for the CIA, or that he was engaged in some sort of secret affair with George, which somehow led to him going missing. In 1996, a book about this case was published titled Oblivion, in which a man who had spent years researching Cox's disappearance revealed his own personal theory about what he believed happened, but Cox's own family disagreed with it. Indeed, there is no concrete evidence to conclusively support any one theory, which is why we're going to explore all the different possibilities on today's episode. Anyway, before we get started, just a quick reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast, which is currently available for download on several platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it, and please leave us a rating or review on any of those sites to help spread the word. The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so if you would like to learn how to support the show, please visit our page at patreon.com slash thetrailwentcold. For as little as $1 a month, you can garner access to exclusive rewards, which may include stickers and thank you cards, early access to episodes, and bonus content. So with all that out of the way, let us now delve into the unexplained disappearance of Richard Colvin Cox. Our story begins in 1950, and our central figure is 21-year-old Richard Colvin Cox, who originally hails from Mansfield, Ohio. Richard, who usually went by the name Dick, was the son of Rupert Cox and Minnie Colvin, and the youngest of their six children, though the family would experience a terrible tragedy after Rupert passed away when Dick was 10 years old. As a result, Minnie would be forced to support her children by operating her late husband's insurance agency. After graduating high school in 1946, Cox decided to enlist in the Army, and after basic training, he was assigned to the United States Constabulary, who acted as a security force in Allied-occupied Germany in the years following World War II. He would be stationed in the town of Coburg as part of the G2 section of the 28th Constabulary Regiment, where he rose to the rank of sergeant. While there, Cox decided to apply to the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York, a service academy which had been in operation for nearly a century and a half and educated cadets for commissioning into the Army. After being accepted into West Point, Cox would begin his four-year program there in May of 1948. Cox did really well academically, and by the time 1950 rolled around, he was ranked at around 100 in a class of 550. He'd also become informally engaged to his high school sweetheart, Betty Timmons, but since Academy rules excluded married men, they were not planning to have their wedding until after Dick graduated. Cox was a member of Cadet Company B2 and was housed in room 1943 at the North Barracks alongside two roommates, Dean Welch and Joseph Urschel. At around 4.45 p.m. on Saturday, January the 7th, one of Cox's classmates, Peter Haynes, who acted as charge of quarters, received a phone call at the barracks from a man asking for Cox. According to Haynes, after he informed the caller that he phoned Cox's room and received no answer, 
the man came across as rude and patronizing, stating, quote, Well, look, when he comes in, tell him to come on down here to the hotel. Just tell him George called. He'll know who I am. We knew each other in Germany. I'm just up here for a little while and tell him I'd like to get a bite to eat, end quote. Now, it must be clarified that even though all the accounts of the story refer to this caller as George, it was never conclusively established if that was the name he actually used. While Hayes later said that he was, quote-unquote, fairly certain the caller said his name was George, he did acknowledge that his position as charge of quarters required him to receive a lot of phone calls while on duty, so he easily could have misheard or misremembered the name. And while Cox would make many references to this man during conversations with his roommates over the course of the next week, at no point did he ever call him George or any other name, instead simply referring to him as that man or my friend. But for the sake of brevity, I will continue referring to this individual as George throughout the rest of this episode. Anyway, when Haynes informed Cox about the phone call, Cox initially seemed to have no idea who this man could be. However, shortly before 5.30, a man who was likely the mysterious George arrived at West Point and entered Grant Hall, a common area where cadets could meet up with visitors. Moro Maresca, the cadet officer of the guard who was on duty that evening, would later describe George as being just under 6 feet tall and weighing approximately 185 pounds, and he was also fair-haired, had a fair complexion, and wore a belted trench coat. George told Maresca that he was there to see Richard Colvin Cox, so Maresca phoned Cox's room to let him know he had a visitor. When Cox arrived in Grant Hall a few minutes later, Maresca said that he shook hands with George. They appeared to be happy to see each other, and George even joked about how good Cox looked in his cadet uniform, aka his dress grays. Cox then told Maresca that he and his visitor were planning to have dinner together and signed his name out in the Company B-2 departure book. The two men then left and climbed into a parked car outside. It seemed likely that they were going to dine at the Thayer Hotel, which was located on campus about a mile away from the barracks, though cadets were only allowed to eat there if they were accompanied by a guest. Later that evening, Cox returned to his room at the barracks, but eventually fell asleep at his desk. When his roommates, Dean Welch and Joseph Urschel, saw him slumped over, they decided to take a picture of him as a prank, little realizing that this would turn out to be the last known existing photograph of Cox. A strange incident would occur at 10.30pm when the bugle call, aka the tattoo, was played over the barracks' speaker system, startling Cox awake. Welch and Urschel then witnessed Cox sprint out of the room, run down the hall, and lean over a banister before yelling something which sounded like, quote, Who's down there? Is Alice down there? When Cox returned to his room, Welch asked him who Alice was, and Cox replied that it was a girl his friend had mentioned before he went to bed and fell asleep again. After Cox woke up on the morning of Sunday, January the 8th, he finally told his roommates about his visit from George. Even though he had signed out to go to dinner, Cox said that they never actually went to eat at the Thayer Hotel, and instead spent the entire time sitting in George's parked car, drinking a bottle of whiskey. Cox said that George would not let him leave until the entire bottle was empty, so he was pretty intoxicated by the time he returned to the barracks. Later that afternoon, George showed up at West Point, and Cox agreed to go out with him again, but he seemed visibly irritated when he returned to his room at 4.30, as he had only wanted to be out until 2.30, and said that George's visit had cut into his study time. Cox told his roommates that George had been an army ranger who served in his unit back when he was stationed in Germany. Cox said they were not close friends, and described George as being quote-unquote morbid. Apparently, George would brag about having castrated German soldiers after he killed them during World War II, and once said that he had gotten a German girl pregnant and decided to kill her by hanging her in order to prevent her from having his baby. At one point, Cox remarked, quote, I hoped I wouldn't have to see the fellow again. George was not heard from over the course of the next week, but the following Saturday, January the 14th, Cox and Welch spent the afternoon at the Academy's field house watching a basketball game. While there, Cox proposed the idea of going out on the town that night, but Welch declined. After the game, Cox and Welch returned to the North Barracks when Cox said he wanted to go check that week's grades. A short time later, Cox joined Welch in the room and told him that George had returned and they were now going out to dinner together. Welch described Cox as looking quote-unquote sort of disgusted about the whole situation, but he said he planned to be back at around 9 or 9.30. The two cadets went their separate ways, but this would turn out to be the last time Cox was ever seen. Cox's curfew for returning to the barracks was 11 p.m., but he did not show up, and when he failed to resurface by the following morning, his roommates became concerned enough to report his absence to their superiors. It wasn't long before a massive missing persons investigation was launched, which involved the New York State Police, the Army's Criminal Investigation Division, a.k.a. the CID, and eventually the FBI. An extensive search was performed of the 15,000-acre West Point campus, as well as the nearby Hudson River and Lusk Reservoir. A pond which was located on the campus was also drained, but this failed to turn up any trace of Cox. It turned out that Cox had signed out in the Company B-2 departure book on the evening of the 14th, as his entry read, quote, Cox, R.C., D.P., Hotel, 1745. Since D.P. stood for dinner privilege, this likely meant that Cox was planning to dine with George at the Thayer Hotel, but no witnesses would recall having seen either of them that night. The only witness who could place George at West Point was a cadet named John Samotis. Shortly after Cox separated from Welch to go check his grades, Samotis reported having seen Cox talking to a man in an enclosed entranceway called a sallyport. Samotis described the man as being dark-haired and having a dark, rough complexion, but oddly, 
This contradicted the description provided by Moral Moresca, the cadet who saw George at Grant Hall, one week earlier. As you'll recall, Moresca said that George had light-colored hair, and Simotis described George as being about an inch shorter and 20 pounds lighter than what Moresca shared. However, since Cox had told Welch he was going out to dinner with the same man he had seen the previous weekend, it seemed likely that Moresca and Simotis had both seen the same man. Other than Simotis, there were no other witnesses who reported seeing George on the evening of January the 14th, and no one could confirm having seen George and Cox leaving the campus together. Since George never left any messages to indicate he was planning to visit Cox at West Point that day, it seemed like Cox had not been expecting him to show up there. On the surface, it seemed unlikely that Cox had disappeared voluntarily as he left behind $87 in cash and checks in his room, along with his prized gold wristwatch. The last time he was seen, Cox was wearing his dress uniform and a long gray overcoat, and since he left behind two suits, he technically did not have any civilian clothing on him. A pair of unmailed, unfinished letters were found in Cox's room, both of which were addressed to his fiancée, Betty Timmons, and it painted a picture of him being unhappy with his situation at West Point. He wrote, quote, I asked Minnie what she'd think or do if I'd give this place the boot it deserves to go to a business or insurance school for two years and then sponge off her until I caught on to the cruel ways of the world. Actually, though, the thought keeps entering my mind and I've yet to discover exactly what I'll have lost by leaving the dear old core, end quote. On top of the letter, there was a pencil drawing of a man spitting on the West Point letterhead. Cox also made reference to his mother in his second unfinished letter where he wrote, quote, If it weren't for dear old Minnie and the ever-increasing clan, I think I'd pull out stakes right now, end quote. Indeed, other cadets would confirm that Cox had told him his only reason for not leaving West Point was his mother. A few weeks after Cox went missing, a letter he had mailed to Germany in December of 1949 was returned to West Point as undeliverable. It was addressed to a woman named Rosemary Vogel, and Cox asked if she was interested in exchanging a few letters. Cox mentioned that while he was stationed in Germany, he and another friend of his from the army had visited Rosemary and her brother in the town of Lichtenfels during the summer of 1947, but since she was still a teenager at the time, Cox wasn't sure if she would remember them. He also mentioned that he was studying Russian and included a few Russian phrases in the letter while also asking, quote, what is the Russian situation in Lichtenfels and the vicinity? It's worth noting that Cox had been studying Russian at West Point around that time, but he had difficulty mastering the language. Oddly, even though Cox wrote that he had enclosed two pictures of himself, no photographs were found inside the sealed envelope. On March the 15th, after being missing for 60 days, Cox was officially declared AWOL, absent without leave, and dropped from the Academy's roles. Obviously, the biggest unanswered question surrounding Cox's disappearance was the identity of the mysterious George, whom Cox had apparently been stationed with in Germany. Military records were checked to see if Cox served alongside anyone who had George as their first, middle, or last name, but if any of them seemed like promising candidates, the investigation would ultimately determine that they had alibis on the night Cox disappeared, clearing them of any involvement. There also didn't appear to be any other cadets at West Point or anyone from Cox's personal life who seemed likely to have been George. In 1952, a CID agent who was examining the Company B-2 departure book in a laboratory would notice that one section had been altered. When Cox went out to dinner with George on the evening of January the 7th and returned to the North Barracks to sign back in, he initially wrote down his arrival time as 7.23 p.m. However, there was a smudge next to the time, which seemed to indicate that someone had gone back and altered it and changed Cox's arrival time to 6.23 p.m. This was particularly interesting because cadet supper formation always took place at their mess hall at 6.30, so it appeared that someone wanted to make it look like Cox had arrived back in time to be in attendance for that. While it was never conclusively proven that Cox was the one who made the alteration, doing so could have led to him being charged with violating the cadet honor code and facing possible expulsion from the academy. So this made everyone wonder why he felt the need to take such a huge risk. Another interesting development took place in November of 1954 when a Coast Guard hospital corpsman named Ernest Shotwell came forward and told the FBI that he had bumped into Cox in the restaurant at the Greyhound bus station in Washington, D.C. in March of 1952. Shotwell recognized Cox because they had been classmates at the United States Military Academy Preparatory School at Stewart Field prior to Cox's enrollment at West Point. When Shotwell approached Cox in the restaurant and started up a conversation, he claimed that Cox told him he had resigned from West Point the previous year and was now, quote-unquote, going to go to work in Germany for himself. Shotwell said that Cox seemed agitated and uncomfortable to see him, and they only spoke for a few minutes before Cox abruptly left. Shotwell claimed he had no idea that Cox was a missing person at that time, which is why he did not share his story until reading about Cox's disappearance in a magazine article over two years later. Well, in spite of the sighting, Cox could still not be found, so after officially being missing for seven years, he was legally declared dead in January of 1957. However, there would be another interesting sighting of Cox provided by an FBI informant three years later. On May the 16th, 1960, the informant met up with a female contact of his named Allie at the Showbar Tavern in Melbourne, Florida, and she was joined by a man calling himself R.C. Mansfield. Allie mentioned that the R stood for Richard, and after sharing several drinks with the informant, Mansfield eventually told him that his real last name was Cox, stating that he had served in the army in West Germany 
and that the army and his mother had considered him to be dead for the past eight years. Following the meeting, the informant shared this information with the FBI, who became convinced that Mansfield was Richard Colvin Cox, particularly since Mansfield happened to be Cox's original hometown. The FBI asked her informant to arrange another meeting with Mansfield on May the 25th, but even though the FBI set up a stakeout for it, Mansfield never showed up, and the informant never heard from him again. The investigation would remain at a standstill for the next two decades until August of 1982, when Jim Underwood, a reporter for the Mansfield News Journal, decided to publish a 12-part series of articles about Cox's disappearance. One of the articles featured an interview with Rosemary Bogle, the German woman whom Cox had written a letter to before he disappeared. It turned out that in 1951, the FBI tracked down Vogel as she had emigrated to the U.S. three years earlier after marrying an army sergeant, which explained why Cox's letter to her in Germany was returned. At the time, Vogel told the FBI she did not remember Cox, but when re-interviewed by Jim Underwood over 30 years later, she now acknowledged having met him after one of his former army friends showed her Cox's photograph jogging her memory. She recalled Cox being a nice enough man, but said that he was afraid of the communists in the eastern section of Germany, which might have explained why he asked about the Russian situation in Lichtenfels during his letter. Underwood also interviewed a former high school acquaintance of Cox's from Mansfield named Ralph Johns, who said he frequently made contact with FBI officials during the 1950s to check on the progress of their investigation into Cox's disappearance. Johns claimed that an FBI agent named Vince Napoli once told him that they had tracked Cox down and were about 24 hours away from picking him up until they suddenly received orders from an unknown source to back off and Napoli was pulled off the case. This caused Johns to speculate that perhaps Cox may have been secretly recruited by a government agency like the CIA. Well, within the next few years, the story would garner the attention of Marshall Jacobs, a retired high school history teacher and World War II veteran from Florida who had grown up near West Point and became so intrigued by the mystery of Cox's disappearance that he decided to perform his own independent investigation. Starting in 1986, Cox would spend the next decade traveling throughout the United States and investigating leads, which included interviewing Cox's family and friends, as well as former cadets at West Point. He also used the Freedom of Information Act to obtain over 1,500 pages of FBI files and additional documents from the CID. Jacobs eventually crossed paths with a former West Point graduate, Korean War veteran, and retired Army colonel named Harry Myhafer, who had authored a number of books about military history. In 1996, Myhafer took all the material Jacobs had gathered and assembled it together into a book titled Oblivion, The Mystery of West Point Cadet Richard Cox. I'll get into more specific details about this later on, but long story short, the theory proposed at the end of the book was that Cox disappeared voluntarily and started a new life after being recruited to perform secret work for the government. At some point during the early 1990s, Jacobs claimed that he spoke to a retired senior CIA official in Florida who confirmed that Cox was given a new name by the intelligence community and spent the next decade working in Europe, performing such jobs as smuggling scientists connected to Russia's nuclear program out from behind the Iron Curtain. At the time the CIA official shared this information with Jacobs, Cox was supposedly dying of thoracic cancer under his new identity at a National Institutes of Health facility in Bethesda, Maryland. Cox reportedly knew that Jacobs had been trying to track him down, but the CIA official warned Jacobs not to make any contact with him or else his life would be in danger. Jacobs also believed that the mysterious George was a former soldier named David Westervelt, who had served with Cox in Germany, matched George's physical description, and was living in the West Point area during that time period. Westervelt was also rumored to have been a recruiter for the CIA, so Jacobs theorized that Westervelt may have offered this as an option for Cox when he expressed his disillusionment about West Point and his life in general. Westervelt passed away in 1969, but there was no evidence to conclusively prove that he was George. The book also hinted at the possibility that Cox was gay or bisexual, a secret which would have destroyed his career and may have given him extra motivation to disappear. While following the book's release, Cox's surviving siblings expressed their disagreement with its conclusions, as they did not believe that he would have run away and broken off all contact with them. His mother, Minnie, had passed away in 1986, and they had a hard time imagining that he would not have made any attempt to get in touch with her ever again. Cox's family always believed that he was the victim of foul play, and in the end, there was no conclusive evidence to prove Marshall Jacobs' theory, though he once told the Associated Press, quote, very few people, even his family, knew the real Dick Cox, end quote. More than 70 years have passed, but the actual truth about what happened to Cox remains shrouded in mystery. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. So while it isn't as well known today as such historical disappearances as, say, Amelia Earhart or Jimmy Hoffa, the Richard Colvin Cox disappearance caused quite a sensation when it originally happened back in 1950. How could a cadet just vanish from the grounds of one of the most prominent military academies in the United States? I mean, it's easy to assume that Cox left Westside alongside his mysterious companion, but since no one actually saw them leaving together, we technically can't even be 100% certain that Cox isn't still there. While an extensive search was performed at the campus at that time, it is 15,000 acres and surrounded by wooded area, so for all we know, 
George could have killed Cox and disposed of his body before he even left the grounds, and Cox's remains have never been discovered to this day. But of course, while the idea of foul play certainly cannot be ruled out, this case is surrounded by intrigue over the possibility that Cox was recruited by a government agency like the CIA to perform secret work for them, so he started a new life under a new identity until he passed away of natural causes decades later. This is one of those unsolved mysteries in which there's a massive difference of opinion between the victim's family and researchers who have studied the case. Like I mentioned earlier, based on the extensive independent investigation by Marshall Jacobs, the book Oblivion came to the aforementioned conclusion that Cox disappeared on his own after the government gave him a new identity and he cut off all contact with everyone he knew until he succumbed to cancer sometime during the 1990s. But Cox's family has always opposed this theory, and I can't really blame them, as from my research, it seems like a lot of people who have read Oblivion have the same issues with its conclusion. That's not to say it couldn't be true, but the problem is that I get the impression Jacobs reached this conclusion based largely on the word of one retired CIA official who didn't offer up any hard evidence to prove what he was saying was true. I mean, he claimed that Cox was dying of thoracic cancer at a National Institutes of Health facility in Bethesda, Maryland. I know that Cox was supposedly living under a new identity at that point, but there are enough specific details here that you would think something like that would be easy to verify. How many men in their 60s would have died of that specific form of cancer at that specific location during that specific time period? This is Maryland during the 1990s. It's not like he was alleged to have died on a mission in the Soviet Union during the 1950s. If you want the Cox family to believe that this is how their missing loved one died, you have to offer concrete proof before they'll accept it as fact. You might recall that a few years ago, I released an episode about the strange disappearance of Paul Whipke, an army lieutenant who vanished from California's Fort Ord in 1958. One of the most prominent theories for that case was that Whipke had been recruited by the CIA and taken out of the country to perform secret missions for them. Indeed, this seems to be a common theory for a number of unsolved cases involving servicemen who go AWOL and are never heard from again. But the biggest flaw in that logic is that these missing victims often don't have anything in their backgrounds which would make them stand out as a likely candidate for clandestine government missions. This isn't meant as a knock on Richard Colvin Cox, but he was a sophomore cadet who was just starting out his military career, and while he seemed to be doing well enough at West Point, he was ranked at around 100 in a class of 550, so it's not like he was a major standout. Even though his CIA work supposedly involved smuggling scientists out of Russia, he was having difficulty mastering the language. The theory pushed forward by Marshall Jacobs was that George was a former soldier named David Westervelt, who had served alongside Cox in the United States Constabulary in Germany, and then showed up at West Point to recruit him. But during his time in Germany, Cox's official job title was working as a clerk in the intelligence office, where he primarily performed clerical duties and had no security clearance. So unless Cox did something really significant in Germany that we don't know about, why would Westervelt or the CIA look at his credentials and decide they wanted to use them for important Cold War missions? And while I won't say I have extensive knowledge about how the government would recruit people for work like this, it's been alleged they required Cox to leave his entire life behind and take on a new identity, even though he had a close relationship with his family and was engaged to be married once he graduated from West Point. When a person suddenly decides to cut off all contact with their loved ones without warning, it draws a lot of attention. Wouldn't it be more logical to recruit someone who didn't have any major familial or relationship ties and wouldn't be missed if they decided to start over? Furthermore, it doesn't make a lot of sense to recruit a cadet by having them go AWOL from a prestigious military academy, which means there will be a massive search effort if he doesn't resurface. Cox's disappearance generated a ton of publicity, and it seems pretty counterproductive to send someone on a covert mission after their photograph has been featured in a number of newspapers. But on the other hand, even though Cox's siblings maintained that he never would have broken off all contact with his loved ones and disappeared, there is evidence to suggest they were not quite the close, tight-knit family unit they portrayed themselves to be. He argued that there was no way Dick would not have reached out to his mother, particularly when she died, but the unfinished letters he left behind for his fiancée really seemed to suggest a lot of resentment in the relationship. It's really interesting how Dick refers to her as Minnie in the letters rather than mother, and it was apparently common practice for him to call her Minnie whenever he spoke about her with his fellow cadets. I do get the impression that Dick may have held some blame against Minnie for the death of his father Rupert when he was only 10 years old. You see, Rupert and Minnie were practicing Christian scientists who did not believe in traditional medicine, and Rupert's cause of death was an aggravated diabetic condition which he refused to seek treatment for due to his religious beliefs. When Dick was a teenager, he suffered a terrible accident where he fell and cut his arm on a scythe, but because Minnie believed in Christian science, she refused to call a doctor to get her son medical assistance. As a result, Dick's cut became infected, and he only wound up receiving treatment when a neighbor brought him to a doctor, but the incident still left Dick with a prominent scar on his arm. When one applies for admission to West Point, they require a nomination from an individual, usually their congressional representative. Well, Minnie helped secure a nomination on behalf of her son from Congressman J. Harry McGregor, a World War I veteran who represented their district. But Dick was reportedly angry about this because he wanted to get into the academy on his own merits. Judging from Dick's unfinished letters, 
It really sounded like he wanted to leave the academy, and he was only sticking it out because of his mother. Prior to his disappearance, Dick had gone home to Mansfield to see his family for Christmas, and even Minnie acknowledged that her son seemed less than enthused about returning to West Point. This does support the notion that Dick could have disappeared voluntarily and cut off all contact with his mother, but would he have really done the same thing to his siblings, as well as his fiance Betty Timmons? Dick and Betty were high school sweethearts, and on the surface, it did not seem like there were any serious issues with the relationship that would make him want to abandon her, though it was reported that Dick had been dating other women in New York during his time at West Point. However, if Dick was secretly gay or bisexual, then that would change everything. I mean, it was tough enough being in the closet back in 1950, but I'm sure it would be particularly difficult if you hailed from a very religious family and were attempting a career in the military. Now, the two people who were closest to Cox at West Point were his roommates, Joseph Urschel and Dean Welch, and they also denied seeing any signs that he might be gay. However, in the weeks following his disappearance, Urschel and Welch started receiving anonymous letters from Greenwich Village containing strong sexual content, and the writer alleged that Cox had a male lover and even made mention of the name, George. During the investigation, the FBI and the CID reportedly obtained statements from three men who claimed to have been engaged in sexual activity with Cox, but these allegations were never substantiated. The rumors about Cox being gay are technically nothing more than hearsay, but I can see how speculation might have run wild about his potential relationship with George. It's interesting how when George made his first visit, Cox initially claimed they were going out to dinner together, but he then told his roommates that they spent the entire time in George's car drinking whiskey. While Cox did appear to be visibly intoxicated when he returned to his room, I can see how it might be inferred that him and George did more than simply drinking while they were in the car together. In addition, Cox apparently altered the company B2 departure book and changed the time when he returned to the barracks and signed back in from 723 to 623. That's the kind of offense which can get a cadet expelled, though, to be fair, since Cox had become disillusioned by West Point, maybe he no longer cared if he got expelled or not. But it does seem kind of unnecessary, because even though cadets were ordinarily required to report to the mess hall for cadet supper formation at 630, they were allowed to sign up for dinner at the Thayer Hotel, as long as they had a guest with them. So you have to wonder if something happened during this additional hour, which Cox did not want anyone finding out about, which is why he altered the time. It's certainly possible that this whole story about Cox disappearing to join the CIA was nothing more than smoke and mirrors, and perhaps his real reason for running away was because he had started a relationship with George and did not want anyone finding out about his double life. But once again, the entire theory about Cox being gay or bisexual is based on nothing more than rumors and is pure speculation. No matter which way you look at it, any theory which involves Cox disappearing voluntarily does not make a whole lot of sense given the circumstances. He left behind all of his civilian clothing and personal possessions, as well as $85 in cash and checks, which is the equivalent of around $940 in today's money. He was believed to only have about $5 on him at the time he went missing, and technically did not have anything else besides his uniform and overcoat. According to Dean Welch, who spent the entire afternoon with Cox, he never gave off any indication that he had plans that night, since Cox had proposed the idea of going out on the town with him. It seems like George unexpectedly showed up at West Point during the early evening, and Cox made the last-minute decision for them to have dinner together. But let's jump back a week to when George made his very first appearance on January the 7th. Like I mentioned earlier, we still can't be 100% certain that this guy's name was actually George, as Peter Haynes, the cadet who spoke to him on the phone, believed this was the name he used, but acknowledged that he could have misheard or misremembered it. So even though investigators looked into everyone from Cox's background whose first, middle, or last name was George, this could have been a false lead. It is interesting how when Cox was informed, he had received a phone call from a guy named George who knew him from Germany. He seemed to have no idea who it was, but when he met George face to face, he immediately recognized him. Even though Cox revealed a lot of information about this man's background to his roommates over the next week, he never referred to him as George or by any other name, and you have to wonder if this was intentional. There are technically two independent eyewitnesses who actually saw George. Cadet Moro Moresca, who was present when Cox first met George in Grant Hall and signed them out for dinner, and Cadet John Simotis, who claimed he saw Cox speaking to a man only about an hour or so before he went missing. What's odd is that Moresca and Simotis each gave completely different descriptions of George, but as I've reiterated on this podcast countless times, eyewitness sightings in missing persons cases can often be unreliable. I think the discrepancy might be due to the fact that Moresca saw George in a well-lit common area, while Simotis saw him standing in a dimly lit sally port and probably did not get as clear a view. Since Cox specifically told Welch that he was going out to dinner with the same man who had visited him the previous weekend, there's no reason to believe that Simotis saw a completely different person. But since no witness is reported seeing George in Grant Hall that night, it's unclear how exactly he crossed paths with Cox to begin with. Now, one of the most bizarre incidents from this whole story took place after Cox returned to his room following his first visit with George, where he was suddenly awoken from his sleep by the bugle call and ran out of his room before he yelled out something which sounded like Alice. Even though Cox told his roommates that this was a girl his friend had mentioned, I don't know how much significance this incident might have. 
I'm sure many of you have probably been in a situation where you've suddenly woken up and said something out loud which didn't make any sense, and if someone heard you and asked what you meant, you genuinely had no idea. Even though your actions were likely related to something which happened in a dream, you cannot actually recall what you dreamt about. I think it's possible that Cox reacted this way because he was awoken from a very vivid dream and was disoriented, but I can see why people have attempted to attach significance to the name Alice. We're going to talk about this in more detail momentarily, but the guy spotted in Florida 10 years later who was believed to be Cox was in the company of a woman named Allie. In addition, David Westervelt, the man suspected of possibly being George, he had a wife named Alicia at this time. Another interpretation which has been put forward is that Cox did not actually say Alice, but Alice Kaput, which is the German translation for All Is Ended, and ties back to his previous service in Germany. Given that nothing else about Cox's disappearance makes any sense, I can see why people would expend a lot of energy trying to interpret this incident, but I'm not sure it's anything more than a freak reaction to a vivid dream. What I do find strange are the stories Cox shared with his roommates about George's background, as he described him doing some pretty unsettling things, such as castrating German soldiers he killed, and murdering his girlfriend after she became pregnant. That's pretty heavy stuff to be mentioning during casual conversation. I mean, I know Cox heavily implied that he did not like George and preferred not to see him again, but there's a pretty big difference between disliking someone because of their personality and disliking someone because they bragged about murdering a pregnant woman. Whatever the case, it does seem apparent that Cox was not expecting George to show up and visit him on the evening of January the 14th, as he had previously proposed the idea of going out on the town with Welch that night. And since Cox told Welch he was expecting to return sometime around 9 or 9.30, he gave off no warning signs that he was planning to disappear. Even though he specifically signed out to have dinner at the Thayer Hotel, no one recalled seeing Cox or George there that night. If Cox was planning to go elsewhere, he could have faced serious disciplinary action for writing a false destination in the departure book and leaving the West Point campus without permission. Even though this was a military academy, it was technically still an open post back in 1950, as civilians could show up to visit cadets and drive through the gates without registering or identifying themselves. Now, if Cox was seen inside a vehicle at one of the gates while in his uniform, I'm sure this would have captured the attention of the guards and he might have been stopped. But if George was behind the wheel, and Cox was hiding in the trunk or the back seat, then George probably would have been able to leave the campus without being stopped or attracting any attention. This might explain why there were no witnesses who recalled seeing Cox or George leaving West Point that night. And like I mentioned earlier, I guess you can't completely discount the possibility that George murdered Cox and disposed of his body somewhere on campus grounds. So what about the sightings of Cox in the years following his disappearance? While any high-profile missing persons case is going to have a ton of reported sightings, the vast majority of which turn out to be false, but the two which were given the most credence in this case were the 1952 sighting of Cox by Ernest Shotwell at a restaurant in Washington, D.C., and the FBI informant who believed he interacted with Cox at the tavern in Melbourne, Florida in 1960. I always give additional credence to sightings of missing persons when they're provided by people who actually knew them personally, and in this particular case, Shotwell said he went so far as to have a conversation with Cox. And given that this took place two years after Cox originally went missing, I don't think Shotwell would have been mistaken about the time period. Some of the things Cox allegedly said do jive with the voluntary disappearance theory, as he mentioned resigning from West Point and going over to work in Germany, and he seemed visibly uncomfortable talking with Shotwell, which would make sense if he was starting a new life and did not want to be recognized. But the official story provided by the retired CIA official to Marshall Jacobs was that Cox went to work in Europe after he was recruited, so what would he have been doing in Washington, D.C. in 1952? Of course, the CIA theory takes on an additional level of interest if you believe the sighting of Cox in Florida in 1960. Unlike with the Shotwell sighting, the FBI informant did not know Cox personally, but this person did apparently tell him his real name was Richard Cox, even though he had been going under the alias R.C. Mansfield, which happened to be the name of Cox's hometown. According to the informant, Mansfield spent a lot of time talking about Fidel Castro and how he only had a limited amount of time left in power in Cuba. Sure enough, this conversation took place only 11 months before the infamous Bay of Pigs invasion, a failed covert operation orchestrated by the United States government to overthrow Castro. In March of 1960, two months before the meeting at the tavern, then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower had allocated $13.1 million to the CIA for use against Castro. So it does sound like R.C. Mansfield may have had inside knowledge about what was going on. But even so, does this prove that Mansfield was Cox? If it was Cox, then this seems to indicate that he got himself in pretty deep in his new role with the government. Of course, I have to remain cautiously skeptical of this story because the source was an informant and details about his background are murky. But the FBI said this informant was very reliable and often provided them with good intelligence. However, if Cox really had been given a new identity to perform secret work for the government, then it seems pretty odd that he would just casually reveal his real name to some guy he met in a tavern. I once again hearken back to the question about why a young sophomore cadet like Cox would seem like a promising candidate to recruit into the CIA, 
But one clue which did suggest that he might have had an interest in this type of work was the letter he had written to Rosemary Vogel in Germany one month prior to his disappearance. He inquired about the Russian situation in West Germany at that time and included some Russian phrases, but you have to wonder why he would try and get in touch with Vogel since she was only a teenager when they first met years earlier and when questioned about the situation, she initially didn't even remember Cox. The oddest detail was that Cox wrote that he was enclosing two photographs of himself, but they were not inside the envelope. Did he just forget to include them? Or did he need these photos for other reasons, such as creating a fake identification for himself? So that now leads us to the key to this mystery, and that's the identity of George. I mentioned earlier that Marshall Jacobs believed that the most likely suspect was David Westervelt, which is certainly possible, but during his research, Jacobs learned about an alternate candidate whom I personally find to be more intriguing. In August of 1985, a wealthy 80-year-old widow named Muriel Barnett was found bludgeoned to death in her penthouse suite while on a luxury cruise ship called the Royal Viking Star, and her 50-year-old personal secretary, Robert Frisbee, was indicted for her murder. Frisbee had been sharing the suite with Barnett and had been working as her personal secretary for 20 years, and Frisbee even claimed that he carried on a years-long affair with Barnett's husband while he was alive. Even though the cruise began in Alaska, the ship was technically in Canadian waters at the time the murder took place, so Frisbee wound up going on trial for the crime in British Columbia. He was found guilty of second-degree murder and received a sentence of life imprisonment before he died in prison in July of 1991. Now, if someone wrote a fictional whodunit murder mystery about the killing of a wealthy widow, Robert Frisbee sounds exactly like the name of a character who would turn out to be the killer, so it may not come as much of a surprise for you to learn that Robert Frisbee was not actually his real name. But here's where it gets interesting. One of the detectives investigating the Frisbee murder was anonymously mailed an envelope containing a newspaper clipping about the Richard Colvin Cox disappearance, and this was eventually turned over to Marshall Jacobs. It turned out that Frisbee was originally born as Robert Dion, and after he enlisted in the army, he wound up being stationed at Fort Knox alongside Richard Colvin Cox, and the two men were acquainted with each other. Dion matched the description of George, and in 1950, he is reportedly involved in a phony ID racket in the New York area. It wasn't long after Cox's disappearance when Dion changed his name to Robert Frisbee and he moved across the country to San Francisco. Now, I don't see any indication that Dion slash Frisbee was ever affiliated with the CIA or any other government agency, as he spent the majority of his life working as Muriel Barnett's secretary until her murder. However, the fact that he supposedly carried on an affair with Barnett's husband adds an additional level of intrigue to the idea that Cox might have been a closeted gay man. I would ordinarily think it's a major stretch to link Robert Dion slash Frisbee to the Cox case, but a lot of the pieces of the puzzle do fit together. Frisbee can be placed in New York State in 1950, and he had served in the army with Cox years earlier, so if they knew each other, it would make sense that Cox would recognize Dion when he showed up at West Point, even if it was a surprise visit. If Cox had become disillusioned with his life and wanted a fresh start, he may have decided to keep meeting up with Dion over the course of the next week, even though he did not particularly like him, because he knew that Dion specialized in creating phony IDs. Of course, that's not to say this theory about Dion being George is a perfect one. Dion and Cox were stationed together at Fort Knox, but I'm not sure if Dion spent any time in Germany, even though that's where Cox told his roommates he knew this guy from. And I don't know why Dion would say his name was George over the phone, unless that was some sort of inside joke between them. Even if Dion manufactured fake IDs, it still doesn't make sense that Cox would disappear on that particular night and leave all of his possessions behind in his room. But this may have been a situation where something else went horribly wrong and Dion wound up killing Cox. After all, we know he committed murder 35 years later, so he was definitely capable of it. And once Cox's disappearance started generating publicity, you can understand why Dion might have felt compelled to change his name and relocate to the other side of the country. Since Dion died in prison in 1991, I don't think he was ever formally questioned about his potential connections to Cox, and he always turned down Marshall Jacobs' request to interview him. For years, Jacobs believed that the most likely theory was that Dion was responsible for Cox's disappearance, though he seemed to change his tune once he got in touch with a retired CIA official who convinced him that Cox had been recruited by the government. But I think it's possible that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Maybe Cox was making plans to run away and disappear under a new identity at some point in the future, but he wound up getting murdered before this could take place. If that's what happened, then George, or whoever he might have been, would obviously be the prime suspect, but this could have been some sort of personal killing which had nothing to do with the CIA or the government. While some of the sightings of Cox, which occurred during the ensuing years, are intriguing, it would not surprise me if he was murdered on the very same night he disappeared and the responsible party disposed of his body. I don't want to outright disagree with Jacobs, considering that he devoted a great deal of time and resources to researching this case, but I still have a hard time believing that a government agency would recruit someone to be a secret agent and make him disappear in such a high-profile manner which ensured that his face would be plastered everywhere. After all this time, most of the people who were invested in this case have since passed away, including Marshall Jacobs, Harry Myhafer, and most of Cox's siblings. As far as I can tell, 
two of Cox's sisters are still alive, and his oldest sister Mary just passed away last year at the age of 104. We may never know the full truth about what actually happened, but if by chance you happen to have any information about the unsolved disappearance of Richard Colvin Cox, please contact the appropriate authorities. Anyway, another special thanks to Charles Cage for narrating the opening of our episode. If you've already entered our listener voiceover contest before, you are automatically eligible for our next random drawing so you don't have to do anything. But if you would like to enter and haven't done so yet, all you have to do is send me an email under the subject line Trail and Cold Contest naming the one unsolved cold case you would most like to see covered on this podcast. So once again, send me an email under the subject line Trail and Cold Contest to robin.warder at icloud.com. That's robin.warder at icloud.com. Now the reminder that The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so please visit patreon.com slash thetrailwentcold to learn how you can support our podcast and become eligible for some pretty neat rewards. We produced a bunch of exclusive bonus episodes for our patrons in tiers 2 and 3, and this past month, I released a fun special episode in which I counted down my top 10 personal favorite acting performances, which took place in reenactments on Unsolved Mysteries. And for our patrons in tier 3, I've also recorded another new audio commentary track, which can be played over a classic episode of Unsolved Mysteries. I'd also like to give a shout out to our most recent listeners who have signed up with us on Patreon this week, and they are Donna S, Jason K, and Temple W. Thank you all so much for your support. Also, provided that it becomes safe to travel again, The Trail Cold is going to be appearing on Podcast Row at the very first CrimeCon UK, which is being held at the Leonardo Royal Hotel in Spa in London on the weekend of September the 25th and 26th. If you would like to purchase tickets to the event, we have a special promo code you can use to get a 10% discount. So to receive 10% off, visit crimecon.co.uk and enter the promo code COLD21. That's COLD21. In addition, I wanted to provide another reminder that I hold live streaming sessions on a platform called Get Vocal. Every Thursday night from 7 until 8 p.m. Eastern Time, I host what is essentially an after show for each week's podcast episode, where I have an interactive discussion about the featured case from said episode and answer questions and address comments from listeners. I always include a link to these sessions in our show notes, so be sure to check there for more information or visit getvocal.com. That's G-E-T-V-O-K-L dot com. I just want to give another shout out to my supporters at the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online Forum and the Unresolved Mystery subreddit. I need to provide a big thanks to Miguel Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. So have yourself a good week and join us next Wednesday for another brand new episode of The Trail Went Cold. Thank <laughs> you.